Well, good morning, church. As Tyler mentioned, we finished James, and we're going to go in a different direction now, very different than what we typically do. Usually we walk through a book, and we will do that again, but we're going to take a break here for a few weeks to do something topical. Topical is not a bad word, okay? Uh, eventually, or Occasionally we do that, so we're going to do that now, and we're going to introduce the topic in just a minute, something I thought about during my sabbatical break. Uh, if you don't know me or where I was during the summer, uh, or maybe you don't care, you're just glad I was gone, but I was on a sabbatical break. I had 12 weeks of no responsibility with the church in order to rest and to do some other things, to read and to pray and to, uh, I guess, get you know, generally refreshed in ways that don't happen when in the crush of everything else going on. So I spent a lot of time in my happy place that looked like that. Whoops, not like that. <laughs> oh, I pressed the button too long. Now you know. All right, forget about that. Erase that from your memory. Jurors. Okay, so uh, my happy place is in my backyard when everything is growing, especially in the spring before the summer beats down plants and leaves it, you know, looking awful. Uh, then uh, when things are, are first blooming, it's glorious. And for whatever reason, grace of God, timing, whatever, the rabbits were not destroying everything in my yard like they typically do. And then I just get angry every time I walk out the door. Uh, maybe we've got more predators in our neighborhood than usual because they didn't eat everything. So I got to see things bloom this spring and summer that I never see because they're always munched down to the ground. And if, if plant, you know, somehow manages to come back next year, awesome. That I never see the the bloom, and this spring and summer, I did. So I don't know if you're into flowers or not. Uh, I, I am, and I love seeing color. And in the, in, the, in the early summer, when everything's blooming and coming up, and you see all this color, it just, man, it makes me happy. So a lot of my sabbatical, when the days were decent, I would be out in that back area of our yard and looking at, you know, glorious color and just being thankful I had the opportunity to do it. So that was sweet. So thanks again for giving me the opportunity to slow down for a while and to look at the flowers and think about other things. So another thing that happens when you've got more time to think and to pray, some things come to mind that, you know, when you're busy or the crush of deadlines and ministry responsibilities and all that's kind of hammering down on your shoulders, there are other things that come to mind, other things you start thinking about and praying about and that's why we're going in the direction we're going uh, for the next few weeks. So I wanted to pull something out uh, of what I think God was telling me about not just us, but maybe the church, maybe the American church in general, I don't know, uh, but kind of the place where we, I think, in my unofficial, very limited opinion, uh, where I kind of think we are to a large degree. So uh, I'm going to get to that. Part of the sabbatic, part of our sabbatical was a uh, a family vacation. So we spent the big bucks and we got away and to that place. So I don't know if you've been to Disney World before. Jennifer and I went a number of years ago. Uh, Ian was in diapers at the time. Uh, Elizabeth hadn't been born yet. So it was a few years ago. So the place has changed a little bit since the last time we were there. And it's overwhelmingly huge. If you haven't been there, it's, it's too much for the senses most of the time. Massive amounts of people everywhere. We we're there. It was super hot. You don't care about this. I'm not going to show you more pictures of vacation, so relax. But I'm just showing you this uh, to make a point. Uh, this is the Magic Kingdom, the big castle, right? So we went to it twice this, this evening show because it really was so amazing. The lights and the sounds, it's not like a show I've ever seen anywhere else. And that's just a still shot to give you some idea of what we looked at. Thousands of people gathering there in the evening, in the heat and humidity, we're all crammed together shoulder to shoulder, literally, to watch this spectacular thing going on on the outside, on the, the face of the castle. And when I say it becomes kind of a religious experience, I'm not exaggerating. So thousands of people in the heat watching this, singing these, songs, these Disney songs that come straight out of the movies, right? Right? And we're all together and we're all happy and we're all one people 
and striving for something better and whatever the words are for these Disney. You can kind of hear the songs coming to mind now, right? If you watch the Disney movies. And you have this kind of moment where we're all in it together and all the strollers, there are millions of strollers at, at any of the Disney parks, okay? Uh, millions of children everywhere that will never remember this moment that their parents spent thousands of dollars on. But we're all there crammed in together for this near religious moment looking at the castle. And after, you know, before and, well, mainly afterwards, I guess. After we came back, uh, it's, there's time to reflect on that. And it really is a cool experience. And you do all this fun stuff. And then suddenly it's over. And you spend all this time and you gear up for this once-in-a-lifetime trip. And woohoo, we're going to get our money's worth. And we're going to be there when it opens. And we're going to be there till it closes. And by golly, we're going to get everything out of it we can. And we did all that. And you come back. And then you have kind of a letdown from from the big experience, right? That you spent so much time gearing up for, and oh, it's over. You know, you got the pictures, but, and it was pretty cool, it was pretty great, uh, and, but, you know, the feelings then begin to go away. And actually, the end before that, because all, all these uh, parents and all these strollers that you're crammed into watching the evening thing, and you have this wonderful kind of religious, quasi-religious experience looking at the castle, Soon as a movie's or the movie, soon as the show is over, you better look out for those strollers because there's now ten thousand people trying to cram into that one exit at the end of the day, and that lady who is singing these wonderful Disney songs is now going to take you out with that stroller to get to that exit door arch before you do to get to the shuttle before you do. So the good feelings go away pretty quick at the end when it's all about me now and i got to get my kid in bed. There's so many things, not just the, the, the Disney whatever or the family vacation, there's so many things that we experience from time to time that are good, maybe great. But all of these experiences, emotional highs, that time where you experience something as a family or maybe individually, they all have an end somewhere. And that end is this aching reminder that deep in me, I want something more. That this experience, yeah, was good, it was fun, but it doesn't fill me up. Now, you can sign up for the Disney holiday trip, whatever, you know, you can spend billions of dollars going there all the time if you want. And people are doing that, kind of to get that the, the vacation high, right? So it never quite leaves me. So I just keep going back. It's almost, it's almost like a drug. It kind of gets into your brain and into your heart. If I could just get more of that good feeling, then I won't have to think about, ah, oh, there is an aching and there's a longing or there is a wish I could have more of, right? To keep me going in life. So I spent some time thinking about that. And as a church, do we kind of fall in, or, the, or church is, do we kind of fall into the same pattern? Uh, of just kind of coming up short. If there's something more for the church and for believers right now that doesn't give in to this pattern of life or of worship or experience where you're, you're, you're feeding on something but it doesn't quite fill you, uh, if, if there's something else, then what is it? What is it that I think, maybe you think too, I don't know, we can think together on this, that I think we're missing, then what is it? What's going on that, that has, it leaves this empty space? Well, as I've been praying and thinking about this, and as God was speaking to me, and he led me back to certain scriptures, and we're going to look at one of those Psalms this morning, uh, here's, here it is. <laughs> here's what I think is missing. The weight of the presence of God in our lives, in real time, as it affects worship, as it affects fellowship, and another way to say the weight of God's presence working in us is glory. Like I said, there's good things that we do, right, that fill us up temporarily, or good experiences that we have that feel good for a time, or maybe even really great. But what do we glory in? What do you find that's above, if anything, do you have something that's, that's not just settling for good or great, 
but something in your life, in your mind that draws you to something bigger and better than those, you know, what I'd say substitutes or temporary fills, something that is truly glorious. That's what I want to talk about in the next few weeks. So the glory, the glory of God, and we'll work, at, you know, we'll work on the, the definitions and, and what this means as we go throughout the next few weeks, but the glory of God isn't God, okay? Uh, it's not, the glory of God is not to be equated with God. The glory of God is the weight, and I'll say it like this, the glory of God is the weight of his manifest presence, okay? As we look at Scripture, as we will look at Scripture, the times when, uh, to put it in real common language, when God shows up, and when we say that, or maybe some of you said, you know, I, I had a moment where it just felt like, or God answered prayer and God showed up in that moment. Maybe that's the equivalent. Maybe that's what we're talking about, the, the presence, the weight of the, the manifest presence of God is what we're talking about the glory of God. Now, the word glory, is it took a weird kind of interesting journey from Hebrew ancient times then to common ordinary Greek that most people used and then even to English. It went through this weird journey. It changed definition. It changed usage. We're not going to get into all that right now. Uh, we will look at highlights of that. Uh, but we talk about glory and things being glorious all the time. And whether you realize or not, or, or connect with it, those of you who are here all the time, how do we end our services? Doxology. That doxa word, that's a Greek word. That's how ancient translators went from Hebrew to Greek for this idea of glory, okay? So when we sing a doxology, we are actually trying to focus on what is glorious about glory. God. I'm not going to sing it now. You never know, if, if you had this happen, when you have things memorized, uh, they don't come to mind unless you're singing it, <laughs> right? So if I tried to speak the doxology right, I couldn't do it. I'd have to start singing it, and I'll spare you over that. But we will sing it at the end of the service. That is our effort as a church to end our service saying, God, you're glorious. And here are just a few of those reasons why we're convinced that the weight of the presence of God is worth our worship. So keep that in mind, okay? Just stow that in the back of the brain a little bit uh, as we come to the end of the service. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about where we find glory in life, in, in, in what Scripture tells us, and how we interact with it. We're going to talk about that, where we find it, and also why that matters a lot for us today. Because if we trade the glory of God for something else temporary that only sort of fills up for a while and it goes away, if we trade the glory of God for the gospel according to the Mickey, we're going to come up empty and you have to keep going back. And there's a passage in Jeremiah that just came to mind right now about that. The empty cistern, it never fills up. The empty well, okay? Or the broken well, excuse me. Never fills up. It's always leaking out. There's never enough. And whatever that well you go to, the glory of God is something that I think we take a little not seriously enough in how we worship and how we live and how we interact with God. So that's my premise, that's where I'm coming from, that's where we're going to consider where we find it and why that matters so much today. We are going to look, we already read one psalm this morning as we entered into worship, we're going to look at a different one, Psalm 29. So if you, have, I, we'll read it here on the screen, if you have a Bible, turn to that, because we'll refer to it here and there. I don't know if I've ever preached from a psalm, so I'm going to give it a shot this morning. And here's the deal with psalms. When you look at the book of Psalms, it's a huge book, right? I don't know if you spend devotions or spend time reading the Psalms or not, interacting with it. It's a whole different kind of literature than what we spend time on usually on Sunday mornings here. And that's too bad. And really, it, it's, it's, the, it's the hymnal. It's the song book. But it, it, the Psalms reveal things to us about God as we sing. 
that I think are meant to engage our heart just as much as our mind. And that's the beauty of worship and singing. And that's really what sets Christianity apart from most religions in the world today. There is something about the voice and song and music that grabs both the heart and mind that leads us to a point of saying glory, which is where this psalm goes this morning. As I was, you know, I can't remember how far or back it goes, but many years ago, I still remember uh, uh, a pastor that I was working under going through Psalm 29, and it came back to me during sabbatical, and I have one of those, not deja vu, uh, serendipitous moments. Ooh, there's a big word. I haven't used that in a long time. It's one of those moments where bing, the light goes on. That's it. That's it. I'm so glad God brought that psalm back to my attention, brought it back up into my mind, because there is something there that we are missing out on that we need to stop and consider. So the psalms do this in a beautiful way. Every page of Scripture reveals something uh, fresh or different or wonderful about God. So there's theology everywhere and what we understand about God. And that's the wonder of it because you never run out of it. Every time you go back to it, whether you, it's a, a, a book you haven't looked at for a long time or, or uh, maybe a book you spent all sorts of time in because it's your favorite book of the Bible. You go back to it, oh, there's something new. I didn't see that before. Well, go figure. His word is living and active. Every page of it is. That's the wonder of it. And that's the excitement we should have coming to God's word and especially the Psalms, because it's not just dry, crusty, intellectual uh, interaction with words. Now we lose some of, we lose a lot of uh, what's you know original and wonderful about the Hebrew and and uh, how the poetry works and how it works into a song. We lose that in English, and and people argue about how it should be translated anyway. But we don't lose all of it. And poetry today is anything anyway, right? I remember as a kid having to write poetry in school. And anybody have to go through that nightmare? Yeah. I hated it. Because it had to rhyme in a certain way, and I stunk at that. So it, for years, it turned me off to poetry. And that was really too bad. And I blamed the school system and all those teachers I had for destroying my experience with poetry. I don't know if you, if you like poetry or not. We, if you don't, get back into it rediscover what's so beautiful about our language and how words can work together to stir your heart, and especially as we add music to it. Uh, it's, it's a whole nother experience that can bring us into worship. That's why we spend time doing all this. That's why we have so many volunteers and so many musicians, so many people helping us to sing to stir our hearts back into worship. So we're going to look at Psalm 29. It grabbed my heart. It grabbed my mind. It's not just an academic or intellectual thing. So we're going to read it. We're going to read it together. I, I hope you can get into it <laughs> uh, in a way that's different than, you know, James, other books we've read. So I'm just going to read it, and then we're going to go back and look at some things. We're not going to overanalyze it, because then it's just dry and crusty intellectual stuff, okay? But there are some things that are so wonderful that we cannot miss this morning, and we certainly cannot miss the glory of God. Psalm 29, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord, glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord, the glory do his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. A few things that are going on in this psalm 
as we begin this little series that I just want to draw out. We'll repeat parts of the, of the psalm as we talk through it. But the first one of this is this. The God of glory that we worship, that we talk about, that we pray to all the time, that we read about in Scripture, God of glory is in the throne room. Verses 1 and 2. What, if you don't remember, maybe you have it in front of you. Ascribe to the Lord. Ascribe to the Lord. Ascribe to the Lord. Worship the Lord. Over and over again, in just those two verses, think of the Lord and worship Him. The, the direction, not just the attitude of his heart, the direction of the psalmist, who we understand is David, that he wrote this, the direction of his heart and his mind and his life is what? Look up. Where is God at as he's talking to us through this song? God is in the throne room. Ascribe to the Lord. Worship. Worship Him. Why is that so necessary? Why, not just necessary, why is that the longing of His heart? He goes on to say, ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due His name. Look to God alone, as he begins his psalm, to, to know, to feel the weight, which is part of that, what that word glory means. The weight of who he is and what he is due because of who he is. So there's more going on. When we see the word glory, yeah, there's honor, there's respect. Those are, you know, those are part of, that you can use those words to define glory, but there's something more to it that gives significance, that gives substance, even that gives weight. If you've ever been in a moment in your life where you consider this was a moment of glory, then it's beyond good or even great, right? There's something that's almost tangible where you can feel the significance you can feel something, like it's almost there, right? There's a weight of something that, that, that comes down on you. That's where David is taking us right away. Look to someone who has uh, a name, uh, glory to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord. Uh, he uses the Lord one, two, three. Well, I didn't count how many times. He uses the Lord's name, Yahweh, the, the sacred, the most holy name of God numerous times in this psalm. Every time he's saying the glory due to who? Not just anybody. The one that we know is over everything. Over the angels even. All these heavenly beings he mentions. He is greater, far greater than anything we've ever seen or anything we've even known of. So what's in a name? character, the history of God dealing with his people, the relationship that they have with him, and how his loving kindness goes on forever, even though Israel's, even though ours doesn't. When you start, when you stop and think about who God is, his character, all these things that are wrapped up into his name, the essence of who God is, then our eyes begin to go up. To, be, to, to again think about who God really is and how He is the only one worthy of our worship, of setting apart and saying, you are worth it all. That's where He begins as we begin to sing and, and consider praising Him. He goes on to speak of this area that's over the waters. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is, is full of majesty. Throughout Scripture, when you see the waters, uh, that, that's usually a signal to, to remind us of what is dangerous and what is unknown. Uh, and it's so, oh, it's so, so fascinating to see how this theme is worked out throughout Scripture. Uh, and, and when we get to Revelation, how the waters disappear. But the presence of the waters, even in, in, in when everything is unformed in the beginning of his creative work, in, in the very beginning of Genesis, 
Water, even there, is something that it's unknown and even dangerous. Uh, even in the first century, uh, going across the Mediterranean happened all the time. But when you went on a ship somewhere, you, you, know, you better, you hope you had your, your will written out. Because you don't know what storms are going to come up. There is no GPS. There's no nothing. So you're still taking your life into your hands or giving it into the captain's hands when you go out on the water. So when we speak of the water, and even in poetic ways, the psalmist is drawing our attention back. There is an unknown there that is almost always a frightening thing. And where is God? Where is God in all that unknown? His presence, His glory is there. He speaks out over many waters. His presence is greater and heavier. It even has a purpose over the waters. So not to get too deep or theological with that, his presence speaking out is a calming reminder that God's at work. God's at work at doing something even though we live in a place that is filled with unknown. He is more majestic, more wonderful, and more glorious than even those things that you fear the most. He speaks out calmly he speaks out from his majestic position of authority where else does the psalm go verses 5 through 8 over the forests and over the deserts he speaks of the voice of the lord breaking the cedars the cedars of lebanon and he works all the way down to verse 8 kadesh here's what's going on the psalmist is giving this big huge perspective as he is seeing God and His glory as He's hearing many times, as you, I'm sure you notice, He's speaking of the voice of the Lord, speaking out into His creation. He's moving us from the far north in what He knows of the geography of the time, from Lebanon all the way down to Kadesh, from the far north to the far south. Everywhere where the eye goes, over the waters, over the land, every place you know of, God is already there. God is already speaking. He is Lord over that too. Even those things, now think about this, as, as we live and breathe and do things every week, as we interact, we go to our work, and the, the things that we interact with, the things that we see, the things that we perceive that are important, that are massive, that are huge, that are impressive even. The things that we have to do and be a part of. God is saying, those things, as you consider my glory, will gain a whole different perspective in your life. As he talks about these cedars, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars, the you know, cedars of Lebanon. I don't, I don't know if there's any cedars left in Lebanon. I, you know, I didn't take time to Google it and see if there's any trees left. But in ancient times, that was what Lebanon was known for. When Solomon wanted to do all his fantastic building projects, he went to Lebanon and got all the cedars that he wanted, apparently, for what he was doing. That place, that area, region, was known for these trees. It is an impressive thing. Everybody knew that. And what does the Lord do? What is he capable of doing? His authority, his position of glory says, I'll smash them all to bits. I'll break them down. I'll lay waste to all that. That's nothing compared to me. The perspective that we have and all of what we do and think, even those things that we're tempted to think fill us up or maybe fill us for a while, they're nothing compared to what God has in charge of. Our perspective on life and reality and stuff changes in the presence of the glory of God. We'll keep moving here over even our worship. Verse 9, he makes, uh, the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. Interesting uh, phrase, interesting verse. As I was studying, a lot of commentators say, well, probably, you know, it should say makes the oak shake instead of about that deal about making the deer give birth. Uh, but most of the translations I looked at still use what a lot of the commentators are saying, well, you know, so there's disagreement on how the language should be translated. 
And in Hebrew, just a slight change can result in an entirely different word, okay? So what's going on there? Well, either it should say, uh, verse 9, excuse me, yeah, verse 9, it should either say, makes the oak shake, and strips of forest bare, which would make sense in Hebrew poetry, a lot of parallel stuff going on, and the second line repeats the first line in a different way. You see that all the time in the Psalms. So it could be just you know, emphasizing the power and the majesty of God, or, and I don't, again, I don't know why so many translators say, eh, that's probably not the white right way, but we're sticking with that translation anyway. Maybe there's something else that is inserted there in verse 9. And this is what I think, this is why I think they're landing on it and why I appreciate it so much. The more I read it, there's something else going on with verse 9 that catches our heart and catches our attention in worship. So either the, his, the sound of his voice flattens everything, or the sound of God's voice, his glorious voice going out over the forest, does uh, or causes two equally wonderful yet different things. Everything knocked down in the forest. God's power, God's majesty there, you know, for us to see. It's on display. Yet somewhere there in the forest, there's new life. There's this deer giving birth. When God speaks, new life happens. Isn't that cool? That in the midst of all this glorious, crazy smashing Yet he's also concerned, and not just concerned, but his voice gives birth, makes this birth happen in the midst of all this other stuff. God isn't just wow, pow, uh, the amazing light and sound show. He's not saying that in this psalm. That's amazing, and that's glorious, but there's also something equally glorious in the birth of this little animal. And God and his glory takes care of both of them at the same time. Isn't that cool? He causes us right in this psalm, as he's reaching the climax of the psalm, to think about how his glory is so powerful and so gentle at the same time. And then the climax is what? What do we do? What do you do when you begin to think about, and, and it sinks into your heart, that our God does that? Our God is filled with wonders like that. What do you do but to stop? And as he says, and all in his temple, all cry, glory, glory. There is nothing else in this earth. There is nothing else that I've experienced, good as it may be, that comes anywhere close to you, God. I give glory to you because you are are glorious. Now, there's no physical temple in Jerusalem at the time when David, there's, uh, there's, the, uh, there's the tent, there's a tabernacle, but there's no physical temple yet. So I think and what most commentators are saying is when he speaks to, or when he says, and in his temple all cry glory, the temple is everything. <laughs> Because God is not limited to walls, right? Scripture says that. He's not confined to a temple as if we could control him like some other idol. Everything's his temple in this sense. You cannot go anywhere without experiencing the glory of God as his voice calls out over everything. Do you have in your heart that kind of a vision for God's glory? Do you have something in you that says, I want more of that? I am not happy with where I've been at and being satisfied with piddling around with other stuff and that, that ends. God, I want a glory in you because the other stuff dies off. But the more I understand and experience God's glory, his man, the weight of his presence, the more I experience that, the opposite happens. The deeper I get into it and the more I wonder at it and the more it fills me up. You cannot run out of the glory of God. The more you dwell on it, the more you think of it, the more you feel the weight of it in your life, the more wonderful it becomes. 
So the more you cry out, glory. I got nothing else but just say glory in you, Lord. Where does he end us? With, we've reached the climax of the, of the psalm, God of glory is in the throne room over the waters, forests, and deserts, over our worship, and from judgment to peace. Let me read it real quick. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Now the word flood that he uses here in this psalm, it's used only in one other place the begin, or back in the book of Genesis where we read about a flood that happens in judgment. Because of the wickedness of the world, God sends forth the rains, the flood happens. And it's, I don't think it's by mistake that he brings us back to the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. He is king forever. He is Lord of what happened. He's in charge of that. He's not dismissing that or I was just ticked at that time. I'm over that now. No, it's part of, you know, God has the right to judge. And he, there is a reminder of that in the wonder of his glory that comes up here in this psalm. But that's not the end of the story for any of us. And that's the beauty. We reach the climax, glory, and he brings us back to what? Peace. I can be in the presence of this glorious God. Why? Because his judgment has happened. How? Jesus came, lived a perfect life, became my sacrifice, all of the judgment, all of the wrath of God because of sin, because of my sin, goes on Jesus. All of it. Judgment has happened. And then as the prophet spoke of uh, Messiah coming as the Prince of Peace, peace then happens. The glory of this psalm as, as we consider it and the glory of God as it weighs down on us is this. The Lord sits over judgment, over the flood. He sits uh, as enthroned as king forever. You can change if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus. If you know that Jesus paid your debt and took the judgment that you deserve, then you can read this and change it a little bit. Because he sits, he sits enthroned over my flood. Not just in general anymore. We can make this intimately personal. He sits over my flood. His judgment is carried out. He is my king forever. May the Lord give strength to me. May the Lord bless me with peace. It ends with that pure joy and satisfaction that I am at peace with the God of glory. Now, we look back and see that. You know, he doesn't mention Jesus' name, uh, so he's not directly in the psalm, but as we look back, as we understand what Jesus did, we see Jesus all over the place in the Old Testament, in the original Testament. And this is one more example. God is still God. Jesus came to do what we can't even fully comprehend, and I am at rest and at peace with God. Does that fill your heart? Do you regularly go back to, yeah, stuff in my life right now can be really screwed up and hard, yep, but there's one thing I know and I hold on to with all my might, that I am at peace with God. And that changes this day. It changes this whole week. It changes eternity. I glory in the fact that he didn't have to love me. He chose to love me. Amazing grace is that amazing as I cling to and enjoy what only God could do in my life and it just keeps getting better. Does that change us? Going back to what I was thinking about during the sabbatical and all the churches I visited and, you know, church attendance and, and church uh, services, 
they, no matter where we go to church, that can become pretty standard, right? And it can you know, even be kind of going through the motions and um, doing what we have to do or doing what we're supposed to do, whatever. All, you know, if we, if we sink into that, then you're normal. Uh, anything that we do repetitively uh, can lead straight to that. I get that too. What we have to work hard at, I think, with our hearts, with our minds, with all of us, is to keep fresh. This isn't just another service. This isn't just another thing that we do to be religiously better. Uh, this isn't a guilt-induced phenomena where we come together and awkwardly interact. No! The glory of God is here with His people as we worship together, as we experience fellowship together, as we sing songs of praise to Him. Oh, here's where I want to go. Next few weeks. Where we find glory and why that matters in the presence of the eternal, living, wonder-filled God. we got to get back to that and, tr and, and work with all our hearts and with all our effort to bring our minds and our hearts back into that presence. And God's Son, our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, in the finished work and future hope of Jesus Christ in all that He is doing and continues to do. And in the ongoing work of the bride, a.k.a. the church, okay, the bride of Christ, that's who we are. Someday we're together with Him in the ongoing work of the bride on this earth. Let's pray. God, so many times, even this morning, we sang of Your glory. I pray, Lord Jesus, that You would work in us in a way to quicken our hearts and minds to respond to the weight of Your glory, that we would see it and experience it again, not just in a emotional, temporary way. Uh-uh. We want to be changed as we see You, as we return to You, as we are affected again by Your love and Your grace, to be profoundly changed by Your Gospel so that all these things we interact with and do, yep, they're good, they're great, they're important, but they just don't compare to the glory of God. Change your church, Lord, in new ways so we can grasp again how great and glorious you are. In Jesus' name, amen.